and then like white dudes got a hold of it and was like, we're going to sell this at a business cinema seminar for $10,000. Yeah. Um, when really I'm like, you don't really need that. Like you can just masturbate. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. I'm so excited to have you. Your here. house is so pretty. <laughs> Thank you. We tried. I mean, we moved in and it was like, n- it wasn't real cute. Like the walls were like a vomity color mm. and everything w- that like didn't match the floors. And we really tried to give it some love. It took a lot. We painted like every wall in this house, I which is a commitment. Yeah. I actually, in the apartment that I moved, just moved into in Nashville, um, their color scheme and the whole ap- apartment building is questionable and for whatever reason all the walls were painted this like hint of purplish yeah and all the ceilings were painted with a hint of green (laughs) so i the moment i knew i was gonna move in there i was like like who can i hire to paint the whole thing white (laughs) because i'm not doing this i'm like just be white like why don't why do i feel like places are like let's just do this really cool like bold color and it's Mm. like just be white it's fine neutral is the way to go like it's crazy yeah but Well, do you want to start by telling us, like, who you are? I like to have people Mm -hmm. do this in a way. I think it's kind of fun to talk, like, as if it's you're telling the fairy tale, like, movie version story of, Mm. like, the the main highlight moments of your life and how you ended up who you are. So you want to give us that, the movie version of Jamie Lee Finch? The trailer? Yeah. Yeah, how you would The highlight trailer? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. Um, Well... I am, oh, it's hard to like think about a different way of describing myself because I like that, I like that framing, but I'm so used to being like, I'm a sexuality and embodiment coach and I do all these things, which is like not untrue. Um, But I think that I arrived at the place of doing the things I'm doing now Mm -hmm. um, because I am a naturally inclined mystic and naturally inclined storyteller. Mm -hmm. um, And... I've been doing that my whole life, um, ever since I was a kid, and in a lot of spaces that maybe didn't um, appreciate that I was naturally inclined towards both of those things. Mm. Um, And so then I eventually left those spaces. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some of those felt more like graduation. Some of those felt more like divorces. Mm -hmm. Um, And then found my way into, uh, as best as I can, embodying the lived ethic of everything I believe in now, um, which would be, uh, which then brings us to these terminologies of like, I'm a sexuality and embodiment coach and Mm -hmm. I'm a poet, uh, intuitive healer, um, sex, witch. that's a fun one. People usually like to perk up at, um, yeah, I, I, I'm a person like I'm a human, (laughs) um, and I am a human who, recognizes that uh the body that i live in is not an object but a person and Mm -hmm. to be honest that might be the most defining characteristic of the way i see the world and then see myself in the world and then move through Mm -hmm. that world so Mm. it's funny because like that's all those titles and things are so niche and unique which is like the world we live in now is that Mm -hmm. you can be like i'm going to create yeah this as like a path and a career and i'm curious how you found yourself falling into that and like deciding this is what this is because was uh, was there anybody that you knew of that was doing anything like you're doing before you decided to do it still isn't there are some people that I know of that do things that are like adjacent to Mm -hmm. what I do but that's actually been one of the hardest aspects of trying to grow what I'm doing from a business standpoint and from a marketing standpoint um is that unless I train someone well you have to go back a couple spaces because I'm like I can't hire anyone or refer out unless I train someone to do exactly what it is that I'm doing, but I can't train someone to do exactly what it is that I'm doing unless I figure out exactly what it is that I'm doing (laughs) and put it like in a curriculum or in a course kind of format. Um, And because I do what I do and I've been doing it for two and a half years and a lot of it is just largely intuitive, it's a hard thing to know how to teach. Mm -hmm. Um, So no, I didn't really see the whole thing ever modeled for me. I saw aspects of it in certain Mm -hmm. places, um, certain bits and pieces of it modeled in various different spots by various different people doing various different things in various Mm -hmm. different industries. And, but every time I would kind of lean in the direction of, okay, well maybe 
maybe what I let's say for example for a bit I was like oh it looks like me being a naturopathic physician Mm -hmm. um so that's totally the direction you I need to go Mm -hmm. and then I hit all these blocks of like well but these other components of what I believe and how I've lived and moved in my body and even aspects of my own journey like don't fit there yeah so I had to piece together a lot Mm -hmm. um both professionally and personally Mm. Um, and that included, you know, doing a, I, so I'm a coach Mm -hmm. and I got my coaching certification from, um, in a space that technically my coaching certification is something in the realm more of, um, holistic or integrative nutrition. Okay. Um, so that's where I kind of started working with the question of how to work with bodies and Mm -hmm. how to be with people and hold space for people who want to be in relationship in certain ways with their bodies. Mm -hmm. But I very quickly realized that I was a pretty shitty nutritional coach because Mm -hmm. I'm like it's not about the food yeah and it's not actually about any of these things that you think it might be about there's layers underneath this that we Mm -hmm. have to investigate and so um I also had my own past experience coming coming up inside of a authoritarian religion Mm -hmm. that I had left before giving that coaching training and all the people that had started finding me to work with me had that same religious background Mm. and had also left Mm -hmm. but had some um, shared psychological and physiological symptoms or Mm -hmm. experiences of what was going on Um, so I just started kind of getting really curious and piecing things together and then went back to school and luckily I went to a place called Goddard College that is a progressive educational institution Mm -hmm. where I was encouraged to maintain those curiosities and also allowed to build a curriculum Mm -hmm. for my own self out of those curiosities Mm -hmm. and so that further training for two and a half years through my academic experience contributed to the type of coaching Mm -hmm. practice that I ultimately and that was back to school for what in particular like what was the program I needed to just finish undergrad because I spent so many years doing like evangelical Christian ministry stuff Uh that I think I was 28 I want to uh-huh. say it was like fall of 2016 um, when I was like, I only have two years of undergrad under my mm-hmm. belt. I need to finish school because again, that was the time when I thought I was going to go to medical school and become mm-hmm. a or naturopathic medical school. And that was separate from the certification, the coaching certification? Yeah, that was okay, separate. Cool. So I already had that. Got it. So I just kind of fused all these things together, all these both um, academic and professional credentials and experiences along with my own personal lived and felt experiences in my body and in my mind Mm -hmm. um, and made it into something I've never seen before. And I really feel like what I created was the thing that for most of my life is exactly what I needed. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's some other people needed that. Yes. There's something beautiful in being able to escape that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you were to kind of get to the root of what it is that you offer, like Mm -hmm. if it, what somebody comes to you for, what would that be? Um, It is the kind of thing I like to say about it is that basically what I feel like I'm doing is um, relationship therapy between humans and their own bodies. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, again, it happens through this shifted paradigm of we are divesting from these um, what I call objectifying systems, which would be uh, capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy, ableism slash diet culture and authoritarian religion, Mm -hmm. which have both overtly and subtly trained us to believe that our bodies are objects or machines or basically um yeah any like objectifies our bodies Mm. and so there is there is a relational currency or lack thereof when we call our bodies it that we don't even realize is Mm -hmm. present and so when we shift our paradigm from calling our bodies it to calling our bodies he she they Mm -hmm. then it becomes this uh like i said almost like this relationship therapy paradigm where you hit these walls and these breakdowns in communication that previously we may have defaulted to uh, interacting with our bodies through the lens of shame and hostility, like we were taught by these objectifying cultures or objectifying systems. Um, and instead, when you personify your body, you're able to slow that sh- that default to shame mm-hmm. and hostility down to, uh, at the very least, you can start with compassion and curiosity. Mm. And what I'm not saying is that you can't get there unless you call your body he, she, or they, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. And I haven't found, it feels like almost like a sneaky, like, backdoor entryway Mm -hmm. into these things that had never really clicked for me before in my relationship with my body. Um, And I've worked with about 150 people in the last two and a half years, and I see it 
for all of those people, I see it change yeah. some major things in the way that they relate to their bodies. Well, you're shifting your perception and like widening it into even like I feel like that that widens it from it being s- like shrinking it into something really specific mm-hmm. where our bodies have so many different systems happening and it's mm-hmm. like this almost like collective thing that is all working together so you're cr- you're making space for that which I could see being mm-hmm. super yes powerful. And y- it's allowing you to interpret symptoms whether they're psychological symptoms somatic symptoms um you start to more easily experience symptom as information Mm -hmm. rather than symptom as my body trying to like i had a client phrase it at one point that her experience of her body was that she had all these ideas of how she wanted to live and move through the world and things she wanted to accomplish but because of you know, chronic illness, for example, mm. her relationship to her physical body was my body's trying to ruin my life. Mm. And in, and that, again, if we can slow down just long enough from immediately arriving at the conclusion of my body's being hostile to me, mm-hmm. and instead, because in a relationship, think about it this way, in a relationship, that's never helpful. Mm-hmm. Like in your relationship with your partner, if you just, if you never give the most generous assumption, the intimacy and connection starts to break down. Mm. But if you can at least work towards slowing down and offering offering to your partner to give them the most generous yeah. assumption e- you don't even have to shift all the way from my body hates me to my body loves me you can at least go to I wonder just wonder I wonder what my body might be trying to tell me I mm. wonder if my body might actually have some information for me about something else that's going on that I might not know about mm. but so many of us have been trained by all these objectifying systems to just immediate like for example, capitalism really wants us to be productive. So yeah. if I get sick, I'm mad at my body because I don't get to keep up with capitalism's measure of my value. Yeah. That's not my body's fault. It's capitalism's fault. Mm-hmm. But I've been blaming my body for not showing up in the world in the way that I've been trained into thinking she should. That should, yeah. It's yeah. the expectation that sets it that way. Yeah. And that translates into a lot of life, I feel, because I hear the same language in, like you said, people talk about other people in that way or even just mm-hmm. the universe and life as a whole mm-hmm. of like it's against me and and re- when really everything is giving us information, our body yeah. and everything's kind of communicating to us like look at something look at this like why is this happening yeah. what, why are you perceiving it that way mm-hmm. like why are you projecting that mm-hmm. there so that it makes sense because that's i've seen that in other areas of my life so yeah yeah that's crazy that's mm-hmm. really helpful is there anything that you found like through working with your clients that is sort of the most common experience or moment that has kind of led them to need like needing this type of work that you've noticed like oh this is what keeps happening mm. to people that's causing this i mean you mentioned systems but mm-hmm. is there any like specific experience that you've noticed being common um i think because there's there is a lot of permission right now in this cultural moment to talk about the harm of fundamentalist and authoritarian religion and also because that's my background i recognize I'm pulling from a very specific sample of people, Mm -hmm. but still, I mean, my honest answer to your question is that a lot of people that find me to work with me are people who are recognizing that the religion they were raised with has harmfully impacted not just their brains, but also their bodies because of Mm. many reasons, but particularly their increased awareness of um, the mind-body connection and also the cultural competency that has um, like our collective cultural increased competency and in understanding that trauma isn't something that happens in your brain, it's something that happens in your body. So a lot of people are able to put these pieces together of, wait a minute, maybe the religion that I was raised with was traumatic mm-hmm. and I experienced it in a traumatizing way. Mm. Um, and so that means something for my bo- like my body is telling me the truth about that trauma. Mm. Um, so that one I think, and that's, I mean, I started out working with people in a way where I thought that was the only culprit. Yeah. And then working with more people over this period of time, um, which I'm really glad I didn't write a book about this yet or create my course yet. Because yeah. I maybe a year ago, I'd probably have just been like, it's all evangelicalism's fault. It's not. There's these even more subtle systems that are working with mm-hmm. evangelicalism. So, mm-hmm. but I think because they're so subtle, I don't often have people who you know, hop on our consultation call and is like, I recognize the ways that capitalism Mm -hmm. has impacted my body (laughs) and diet culture is causing me to dissociate and Mm. to harm myself. It's usually, at least from the people coming to talk to me because they've heard me talk about my background. They'll be like, look, 
I left the church five years ago and I'm just now realizing that I'm not fully, I'm still dissociating. I'm not present in my body or because of being a sexuality and embodiment coach, a lot of people come to me um, with some sort of very present story of uh, what they would maybe call sexual dysfunction or Mm -hmm. some way in which they're experiencing their body. uh, I always have to be really careful with this language, but like (laughs) they're experiencing their body not working the right way mm. in either a partnered sexual experience or masturbation or self-pleasure. Yeah. Um, and even that's its own thing because we have to like decenter the idea that there's like a right way to have sex mm-hmm. <laughs> on its own and try to remove that shame. But that yeah. would be the biggest one is people realizing, or the two biggest, people either realizing there's something maybe imbalanced um, in their relationship to their sexuality that they want to get curious about or, you know, heal. Yeah. Um, or fix might be the framing that they would use, but we don't use that framing. Mm-hmm. Um, or just that recognition of, I now know that the religion I was raised with impacted me in some harmful ways. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like there's kind of a common factor in those things about like expectations or shoulds. That's it. Where it's like mm-hmm. you have something that's telling you how you think your body's supposed to be or you're supposed to be and it's not matching up. So yep. then you're like, oh, there's an issue here instead of like, listening to oh this is what's happening i wonder why like and just kind of being curious and open about that yeah seems to be a big it's so fascinating because one of the main things that i found that is a common thread with every single person i've worked with no matter what that i i wonder and feel pretty confident in this assertion but almost everybody thinks that they're just like being a human the wrong way because mm-hmm. it's the way they're doing it. Mm. And so they're looking at everybody else and thinking, oh, they've figured something else out that I haven't. So I must be yes. being a human the wrong way. And so yeah. it's that shame thing. It's like when we are trained into defaulting to shame, we're always going to assume we're doing something wrong and being someone wrong. And so this work of, wait, my body's a person. They have information for me. I can talk to them. Um, shifts it again into this relational model of uh, – making it so that we don't have to default to the shame we were trained to default in and we can Mm -hmm. at least again shift to compassion and curiosity and this permission and this agency that people discover Mm -hmm. of this recognition that like i don't think there's a right way to be a human person beyond like don't harm others beyond that there's really no correct way to be a person Mm -hmm. and i think that that the shame again, that's linked to these, the body uh, body objectification we've been indoctrinated into. It's that shame that's keeping us from, from giving ourselves that permission and agency to be like, I can just relax and rest in being exactly who I am. Yeah. Wow. That, yeah, that's like life changing. Cause I've, I've had a lot of realizations recently too, about just how like, we're always kind of striving to have a certain level of whatever idea of perfect we have of like once I have this going in check and once I'm doing this Mm -hmm. and like trying to match up to that view that we think somehow uh, we think everybody else has that figured out and we're like projecting that outside of ourselves and once I get there then I can finally you know whatever that is for that person Mm -hmm. and I've learned more and more in my life that everyone around us like that's we're totally just projecting that idea of having it figured out or like yep how, like what it looks like to be healthy or what I, and like we've been given this idea that doesn't exist like yeah. no one is living that like no, no one. one is doing no that one. so if we yep. can just be honest with like okay this is what my body's this is what it wants like even sexually speaking like i'm i don't want this in the way i think i should mm-hmm. like can i just have acceptance for that first yeah and say okay like yep this is okay this so is what i'm feeling many people aren't having the sex they want to be having because they are trying to have the sex that they think they should be having. Yeah. And it's, so, I mean, and it, it's in my brain too. And it's so frustrating. And it's, again, having this really specific vantage point of like people feeling safe enough to come to me and talk to me about in like intimate details of their sex lives with themselves or with other people has allowed me to see that thing I just said really clearly and then also see it in myself really Mm. clearly and try as best I can to be compassionate and loving and communicative with the information my body has for me and stop trying to hold myself to a certain standard and just get curious about what actually brings me pleasure yeah like it's just it's such a it should be simple and it sounds simple when I say it but it's like the most complicated thing in the world yeah well we're not really taught how to do that either it's kind of Mm -hmm. like you just need to be just know how to do this Mm -hmm. like you should just automatically be like an expert and then in like religious culture you have that mixed with the fact that it's like 
you should not think about this at all mm-hmm. and then be like an expert yeah. all of a sudden and then a, a switch flips and yeah the divine will make you good at this thing that you were previously not allowed to even be curious about yeah and it so sets a lot of people that? up for some pain that, and like, disappointment like i can't think about this like this is bad i don't want this i don't mm-hmm. want this i can't think about this uh-huh. don't do it and then all of a sudden you're supposed to be like now i want it all yeah. the time and it's amazing yeah just because your brain changes its mind about what you yes. can and cannot do doesn't mean your body is going to forget everything you've been taught mm-hmm. for all of your formative years about what would make you safe and yes. unsafe particularly when the stakes are so high like if you don't follow the rules you can go to hell like mm-hmm. that like my body loves me enough to not let go of that story immediately because yeah. i've been required to believe that there's a certain way to live in the midst of that story that will make me safe mm-hmm. and my body's whole job is to make me safe yeah so that's why again this us learning about the somatic experience of trauma mm-hmm. and how what's unresolved and when when we've had a traumatic experience or something that's created a traumatic unresolved impact on us it's not just something that happens up here it's something mm-hmm. that happens in our bodies mm-hmm. and that's why the language around religious trauma is really important so people have the yes. permission to recognize oh this qualifies as trauma yeah because it has everything to do with my my safety yeah and, and my felt sense of whether or not i'm safe in the world and your entire paradigm of how to see and exist in the world like because i when i read your book i didn't like I didn't fully realize until I read that how how much th- what I had experienced was like super traumatic for mm-hmm. me because there's kind of this thing even that like years after leaving that type of space and you know moving on with my life and thinking yeah I don't I'm not with that stuff anymore it's like whatever I'm cool there was something where I still was like yeah like all love and it's great and mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that But then as I was reading your book, I was like, oh, my gosh, like I just wasn't even aware of the level of what I had gone through. Even like when you're talking about as a little kid being like singing these songs and being Mm -hmm. told these stories Mm -hmm. that are just so terrifying. Like, why would you say those kinds of things to a kid about like burning in hell and like needing Mm -hmm. like I it really was eye opening to me to just become aware of the own like have more acceptance and awareness around the level of trauma that I had faced that mm. I wanted to just like brush under the rug and be like no yeah. I'm just over it now yes. and it's not a big I changed deal. my mind I don't believe it anymore yeah I don't cognitively ascribe to that ideology any longer so I'm sure everything's fine now and yeah. again we're not really saying that to ourselves consciously but that's what we're expecting that's the pressure we're putting on our bodies mm-hmm. is just forget all those things we're like asking the, the person of our body to forget everything that we were taught yeah about what makes us again really high stakes safe or unsafe Mm -hmm. she loves me too much for that she's gonna have some information for me about why that does not feel safe for her to do yeah for sure Mm -hmm. wow that's such a helpful perspective well to plug your book while Mm -hmm. we're talking about your book sure (laughs) what's yeah you want to tell us about your book and where we can find it um i have it's uh, speaking of religious programming i've said the title of my own book wrong so many times <laughs> because it's very intentionally named to be kind of the opposite of a verse that a lot of us were taught when we were younger um so the title of my book is you are your own mm-hmm. a reckoning with the religious trauma of evangelical christianity mm-hmm. um and that verse was you are not your own in mm-hmm. the amount of times that i have said the title of my own book like it's that verse. you've said it you are oh, not yeah. your own yeah oh my god i've said it even i said it one time on a podcast and the host of the podcast caught like, me wait. they were like wait a minute that's <laughs> not what it i was like oh shit that's right but wow. i mean programming it's yeah, intense it's, it's an intense thing yeah wow but yeah it was very intentionally named to kind of center the fact that that is not true that yeah. you do belong to yourself yeah well it's a great read for anybody mm-hmm. experiencing that and i really enjoyed it for Thank sure you. i'm curious what you meant you talked a sec for a second on like the dieting aspect, which I'm really mm-hmm. curious to talk about that a little bit too, because I know a lot of people, that's like something I've really become mm-hmm. aware of in myself mm-hmm. and people around me. And I think it's really tricky because there is like, you know, this desire to want to be healthy and it can look like taking care of my body, like right. doing what I want for my body. So what is that? Like, how do we navigate that line mm-hmm. between having a desire to you know like eat well and take care because you studied nutrition too mm-hmm. so I'm curious what mm-hmm. you think as far as that like body image and dieting and yeah how we can navigate that particularly as women but I know men go through it too yeah I think that well that's one of the things 
that is funny to me when I look back on why I wasn't a good health coach, but I'm great at the type of coaching I do now, is because I had had too many years of my own experience with various different forms of disordered eating Mm -hmm. um, to feel comfortable coming into a space where I would be coaching someone into um, just finding a new blueprint yeah. or a new or another avenue of control mm-hmm. and I, what I don't mean is I, I, I wasn't trained in that necessarily in the program I went through um, but I do think there are still lots of pieces of the prevailing narrative of diet culture and ableism even in and sometimes especially in more holistic and integrative spaces um, because there's this like false equivalency between um, how you choose to eat and how you choose to move with like your overall morality as a mm-hmm. person and even the terminology of like like the fact that we have a terminology like clean eating yeah. is really upsetting and problematic and and can be kind of dangerous actually mm. so I yeah so my own personal experience of having oh just constantly just trying to find a new a new rule and mm-hmm. then when that rule didn't work give me another rule and that rule didn't yeah. work and then my body again um, I had a lot of a lot of health issues, which did kind of force me to have to get curious about if I had any allergies or any um, intolerances. Mm-hmm. So that at least got me curious enough to start listening to and experiencing symptoms as information. Mm-hmm. Or if I eat something, and because I'm trying to identify an allergy or intolerance, so if I eat something, then I get to notice mm. what happens. And it was that noticing rather than just being given some rules, like you're supposed to be vegan, yeah. you're supposed to be paleo, like give the invitation to notice how my unique body interacted with and reacted to eating certain things allowed me to begin to do what I didn't know at the time was called intuitive eating mm-hmm. um, and to develop a relationship to eating intuitively for the first time in my life. Mm. Um, and so there's definitely a lot of people who uh, and even in specific like intuitive eating coaches who you know if you google you can find them and they know way more about that than I do but my own personal experience with shifting from a diet culture based rule oriented paradigm that measured my morality by the way the way in which I ate and the foods I ate and how much I ate into wait a minute let me listen to my body let Mm -hmm. me experience cravings as information not something to avoid or to Mm. you know move away from which I think is something we're trained into as women too it's like Mm. if you want it don't have it which is yeah the layers of dysfunction involved in even that idea and like Mm. what we're doing to ourselves when we agree with that but um yeah learning how to pay attention to what my body apparently had to say to me about how she felt and how I felt when I ate certain things as opposed to other things and Mm. I think what's so beautiful about that is I can find what works for me and someone else is going to find what works for them. Mm-hmm. And so it inherently, if you are, if you are moving in the direction of eating intuitively, it becomes unfundamentalist yeah. and it becomes something where you don't get to say there's one right way. Just like there's not one right way to be a human person. Yeah. There's also not one right way to feed yourself as a human person. Mm. Everybody has to, I don't say has to, but I feel like the invitation is there for us hopefully to be with ourselves, learn what our, our specific bodies are telling us that they most need to function well. Mm. Um, but I do think that diet culture and capitalism married with one another make that really yeah. difficult to do. Yeah, well, and you can see in that the fact that there's so much different information about how you should eat and mm-hmm. this diet or that mm-hmm. diet, and they're, like, seem so opposite and, like, completely, like, counter to each yep. other. And so that, to me, just shows, like, everybody's bodies are different what yeah. works for one person might not work for you yep. so to follow like a set of rules and know this is what's like i need to do and usually those are crafted for a second sp- or a specific external result right like having your body right. look a certain way or burning a certain yes. amount of fat which doesn't necessarily mean that you're healthy <laughs> right just 1, because you look percent. like a certain way yes so. and that's it and that's also like a dangerous assumption right like mm-hmm. assuming that size or shape of a body has any is any accurate measure of health or Mm -hmm. wellness at all is just blatantly inaccurate and it's it's really it's honestly dangerous because I've I've heard everything in the people you know in the experiences of the people I've worked with and I've heard both ends of the spectrum which is that my clients who have larger bodies 
um, who have uh, physical illnesses, chronic illness, whatever it might be, something, an imbalance of some kind, they go to their doctor and literally all they're told is lose weight. Mm-hmm. They're not taken seriously. Yeah. I've even had clients who, are told, who were told you don't have this specific health issue that you think you have. You actually just need to lose weight. Mm-hmm. That's extremely dangerous. And then I've also heard from clients who have health issues and have chronic illness or some kind of imbalance going on in their body. Yeah. They want to take care of themselves. They go to the doctor and they present as classically thin. And yeah. they're literally told by their doctors, you can't be sick. You're thin. You're mm-hmm. clearly not sick. You don't have this health issue. So I'm like, either end of the spectrum, appara- and that's the whole thing. It's a trap. Like, apparently, there's no right way to be in a body mm-hmm. and be taken seriously. And again, I don't want to mischaracterize all doctors because that's yeah. not the case. And I've had some that have been powerful and honestly life-saving in some mm-hmm. ways. But I think it's the, it's the doctors that have divorced themselves from that false assumption who have been really helpful. Yeah. And the doctors who unfortunately have not divorced themselves from that false assumption and are maybe still believing the bullshit that is the BMI, that mm-hmm. they're thinking like size and shape of, of a human body is the full measure or the most important measure of health, and it's not. Yeah. Dang. And that even ties back into the same thing of like expectations, outside pressures, mm-hmm. look a certain way, be a certain way, act a way. Yes. Like it all, it's funny how things all yep. tend to like, once you find that thing, it's like everything in my life is like connected to this yep. thing. And it is a trap yeah. because you might by some metrics of some of those objectifying systems might be like nailing it Mm -hmm. and then the next day they're going to move the goalpost and then Mm -hmm. you're not doing it right again so they're these objectifying systems are trying to make you think that even their measures are objective Mm -hmm. when really they're incredibly subjective and that's on purpose because they want to there's a lot of reasons for that but if you're stuck in like a shame cycle Mm -hmm. you're gonna be again it's i mean it diet culture tells on itself because if you're stuck if you're not eating intuitively, it can continue to sell you a new book mm-hmm. or a new diet or a new thing that they want to make money off of. Yeah. So to step outside of that system, you're stepping outside of patriarchy and white supremacy because it's white supremacist beauty standards that say like thinness yeah. and whiteness is, is correct. And you're stepping outside of capitalism and you're stepping outside of ableism. And we could go down this rabbit hole. We don't have time. We don't have to. <laughs> but the religion of my childhood, evangelical, white evangelical Christianity, was yeah. super obsessed with thinness as a measure of holiness as well. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of people, again, who know more about this than I do, who've had this experience where they talk about how their disordered eating was encouraged yeah. by that conversation around thinness equals well, holiness. Well, even fasting culture can yes, get really that. like into Again, I've it's heard it from it's like so many of my clients. Resisting like Resist your desires. Desire. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's all it's all caught up in there for yes. sure. Yeah. I need to get my other little read. I definitely want to get into some sex witch stuff. Yeah. Because we all know that yes. everybody wants to hear about of that. Course. So explain sex witchery. What mm-hmm. is this? Yeah. How do we do it? How do we do it? <laughs> it's really easy. Some people might already be doing it and just not know <laughs> not it. Not knowing um, that they're a witch. <laughs> it's true. I mean, I was and I didn't know I was. <laughs> um, so witchcraft itself so to talk about like what sex magic is you kind of just have to like talk about what magical practice and what witchcraft Mm -hmm. is in general and it's it's not that spooky it's not satanic it's not that crazy either right yeah although i do have a black cat but (laughs) that's fine and i do have a broom on my door because there are some there are some legitimate like pagan practices at least for my ancestors um celtic ancestors that i've been trying to pull from because Yes, there's been this like cartoonish mischaracterization of what it means to be a witch, but some mm-hmm. of those were rooted in yeah, reality and practice. It's like like making a potion. It was just herbalism. Yeah. It's not that weird. Yeah. So like it's to tonic reclaim that we're exactly, it's tonic. Right That's what <laughs> you yeah. just made I'm us. I'm a witch. You're a witch. You made us a potion. It's yeah. perfect. <laughs> um. So yeah. So it's really what what witchcraft is. It's a recognition of. Um. I mean the the really simple math that I like to explain with it is it's energy plus intention plus action Mm. equals witchcraft so anything any practice any ceremony any ritual any tool that helps you uh, connect with and um, increase your energy or um, harness your energy and then take that energy combine it with your intention what it is that you most want to see and manifest in the world whether that's for collective justice or for personal healing um, and then combine that with thoughtful action, taking action in the mm-hmm. world in, ag- in agreement with and in line with the intention and the energy. 
that's magic. Mm. You're doing it. Also so whether it's, it's the key to success. Of that's <laughs> well, yes, exactly. And then like white dudes got a hold of it and was like, we're going to sell this at a business cinema seminar for $10,000. Yeah. Um, when really I'm like, you don't really need that. Like you can just masturbate. <laughs> Which yeah. I, I, that kind of feels like I'm being, I don't know, uh, what's the word? It kind of feels like I'm, I'm making light, but I'm, t- I don't know. I'm truly serious. Like it really yeah. is. Um, so that's why I'm like sex magic isn't that weird. Um, because like I said, any tool or any ritual or ceremony you're using to build a relationship with your own energy, that's your tool. That's your mm. magical tool. And the reason why I love sex magic is because your tool is your own body. And mm. so of course that's like my thing so I'm like that's that's not surprising to me and I do use other tools I mean I use crystals and pendulums sigil magic candle magic spell work uh, tarot cards things like that kind of more classic witch stuff but I I have found that my relationship to uh, again because of all the other work I do of like my body's a person let me live and move through the world and thinking about the fact that I'm in relationship with her Mm -hmm. um, it makes so much sense to me that the magical practice that most appeals to me and that feels most powerful for a uniquely me is the one that happens in my physical body. Mm. Um, so that's, I mean, sex magic is, I had someone say it recently. They're like, so it's just really intentional masturbation. And I was like, yeah. kind of. So yeah. what is it about like the sexual act that like adds to that intention of everything that you said about like wit- what witchcraft is and with the intention and the mm-hmm. act and the manifestation, what is it about sex Mm -hmm. that aids that Mm -hmm. well so sex uh so it's really just and again this is either partnered sex or self-pleasure um or you know group who knows Mm -hmm. no judgment um so it's really just that sexual energy just is one form of energy there's lots of different forms of energy that we can tap into and sexual energy is either adjacent or is the same thing as creative energy Mm. um and even if we're l- you're looking at like the energy centers in your body or like the chakras, like the sacral chakra, mm-hmm. um, it is what we view identified as the se- like the kind of sexual mm-hmm. area. Or that's like the sexual chakra. And it's also the place of creative flow mm-hmm. um, and cre- the creation of a creative flow. Um, so I think that what makes that so spe- again, you can tap into your creative energy in any other way. But for me, at least it feels like this. Um, it's like you don't have to go from I don't have to use a separate tool to help me tap into my creative energy it's like I'm just going straight to the source yeah um I also think that there's another aspect of it that I really like which is that it helps me decenter the idea that sex itself is only one thing which is Mm -hmm. a heteronormative construct where a penis grows in a vagina Mm -hmm. um that's not all sex is Mm -hmm. like lots of other things are sex, including lots of other activities that you can get up to as a partner that doesn't just, uh, like, it's weird that, like, we would, we have this thing that we do where we're like, oh, we didn't really have sex. And when we say that, we think it's just the penis didn't go in. It's so weird. It's so bizarre. So I think being able to to call many other things sex and say, like, Mm -hmm. sex magic people automatically assume that's something I'm practicing with not only a partner, but they assume it's a male partner, which again yeah. is, you know, we're telling on ourselves. Um, when actually I've never practiced it with a partner of any gender, and it's been totally autonomous and just in situations of self-pleasure mm. so far. So I'm like, that's still sex. Yeah, It's still sex. Yeah. And we deserve to recognize that that's sex. It's good. It seems really powerful, too, for women um, to be able to have, like, to kind of take back their power around sex yes. by to ha- like call like I'm doing this and I just need myself and my body to do it and to be able to think about sex in a way that doesn't involve a penis mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. I feel like is really powerful to work against the narrative that yeah. you're speaking of that like it kind of is all focused on male pleasure yeah and that just yep. leaves out so much yep. like that is there and available to us yes. and that people might be like into or yeah so i think that that's really cool about it my relationship to sex magic and my increase in that practice has absolutely transformed my relationship to pleasure period mm-hmm. and not just sexual pleasure just my entire relationship to pleasure and desire across the board mm. mm-hmm. that's interesting mm-hmm. yeah because i think a lot i've started to realize a lot of people have this fear of pleasure and fear of being happy i've noticed it in myself yeah where it's like we all are like I just want to be happy I want to feel good but then like 
we don't want to like yeah. we say we do but yeah. then when we start to we get scared or we're like no this is bad yeah. why yeah. do you think that is um whew, great question <laughs> and I'm like going through it right now because yeah. I literally just realized a couple days ago that um even the fact that I don't live in Los Angeles yet and I'm still living in Nashville and like I was saying to you earlier I was like I don't even know how to tell you why I still live there well yesterday what's today Tuesday yeah yesterday a piece finally clicked for me and it's that in Nashville I'm so kind of comfortable but in like not the best way in the way that's like I'm kind of like numb and I'm just in a rhythm and I realize that I am actually afraid of being happy mm. and that's why I haven't moved to Los Angeles yet is because every time I'm here I'm aware actually on on a body a deep body based level I'm aware of what being happy feels like mm. and I apparently have an inner story somewhere in there who knows where it came from probably came from a lot of different places but now she and I are going to talk about it yeah like apparently I have this inner story that says oh I'm only allowed to vacation in happiness mm. I have to live yeah. in like n- a neutral comfortable space mm-hmm. and when that clicked for me yesterday it was this kind of like oh I'm telling myself this story that happy Jamie only gets to exist like I don't believe that me being happy or me accessing happiness or happy Jamie mm-hmm. like I I don't believe that she gets to be like the full-time Jamie yeah like she's somewhere I can visit but not live mm-hmm. and that's why I'm like holy shit that's why I've been visiting Los Angeles and not living here even though all the things and people that make me the most happy are here there's been this unexplainable homeostasis <laughs> around why I just yeah. keep sitting in Nashville but coming here for like 12 days every two months and thriving. Yeah. So I finally, I'm like, yeah, I, I need to quit that. I need yeah, to hack that. Now that. that I know that that's what it is, is I've had this fear of being happy. Yeah. I need to do two things. Number one, get really curious about where that came from so she and I can talk about it and work on it and probably go tell my therapist so she, she and I can talk mm-hmm. about it and work on it. But that means I also have to move to Los Angeles. Yeah. Because now that I know that that's what's going on, that you it's this it. story of the fear of happiness. And like, again, my witchcraft informs me that it's not just energy plus intention equals magic. It's energy plus intention plus action. action. Mm-hmm. So I, I have to do it. It's a big part a lot of people forget about. For yes, sure. absolutely. I feel like one thing that helped me in realizing that I was doing that was something that I actually read in Mike's book, our friend Mike McCart's mm-hmm. book, yeah. that he got from Hillary, mm-hmm. which is like the secondary emotions versus the primary emotions. Mm-hmm. And that when we do like guilt and shame and everything, yes. we're avoiding a primary emotion. And that yes. one of those emotions is happiness. happiness. That's and it. so sometimes I'd find when I'm feeling like anxiety or shame mm-hmm. or guilt and I'm like, okay, what am I avoiding? It's not this, not this, and it's not this. And be like, it's happiness. It's like happiness. I'm avoiding happiness mm-hmm. by instead choosing guilt or shame or anxiety yes. to avoid that yes. and that's what made me realize like whoa what's yep. my issue with being happy that's it <laughs> that's and that's crazy. another reason why I was saying like my relationship to sex magic has transformed altogether my total relationship to pleasure and desire mm. because I now know what pleasure and desire feels like physically in my body and mm. I was so dissociated for so many years I couldn't have told you what that was like and that is the only reason why I had the moment I had yesterday yeah. which is I now know what happiness feels like yeah. and what happiness doesn't feel like. And it yeah. took me a while to put those pieces together as it relates to my literal living location, mm. but I did. And if I hadn't worked on that relationship, so how does pleasure feel? Mm. What does noticing a desire, what does it feel like? I don't know if I would have been able to notice the emotion of happy in yeah. my body either. And affirming that like this is okay, this mm-hmm. is good, because yes. nothing, we can't really do like – fully transmute anything into us until it's in our body and in our experience because like we're a very heady culture and it's like ideas are floating around and it's like you read something you hear it and then you're like tweaking it and Mm -hmm. you haven't even like Mm -hmm. put it in your body yet you have to feel it and experience it and do it and put Mm -hmm. it in practice and say Mm -hmm. oh I see how this feels Mm -hmm. for it to really change your life and affect you and a lot of times we try to skip that step and just like know everything yes like and you can't know your way into freedom I think that's a vulnerability avoidance thing too where you Mm. just try and like I know I do it where I just try and stay up here and gather all the information and talk about it as if I have integrated it or I love that word you chose transmuted yeah like I'm almost I'm playing like I'm living it yeah because I'm telling myself the story up here that I I understand it but that doesn't mean I've embodied it yeah 
So I'm glad you like my words because you're deal. the word queen. You're Thank good you with it. You say all the right words. Thanks. I can tell you worked Thank really you. hard on like using the right language. Yeah. So props. Oh my gosh, my Mercury and Gemini feel so seen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you good. so I much. You. Yes. I hear all your <laughs> correct <laughs> phrases. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to ask you some rapid fire questions Ooh, and then we'll wrap mm-hmm. this thing up since we're getting close. I love that. All right. Some of these are like silly. Some of these are very existential. All right, you ready? ready? Mm-hmm. What could you eat for a week straight? Sweet potatoes. What is the biggest mistake humans have made? Money. <laughs> yes, big move. <laughs> Current celebrity crush? Chris Evans, always. <laughs> is this real? Is it? <laughs> I'll answer your question with a question. <laughs> That's good. That's appropriate. Okay, there's a spider in your house. Do you kill it or do you set it free? I absolutely, I'm a witch. I can't, and specifically spiders, their webs are like protection. It's mm. a whole thing, but no, I'll definitely set it free. Maybe keep it. <laughs> I okay. know. If it was a cricket though, out. Okay. Gone. Good to know. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that answer. Where do ideas come from? You reach up and just pull them down, mm. I think. I like that. Mm-hmm. If an alien asked you right now to go to space, but you might not ever come back, would you go? Yes. <laughs> I want to go find everything Ray Bradbury told us we could possibly <laughs> find. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. What's the best milk? Milk? Like oat milk, coconut oh, milk. Oh, cashew for cashew. sure. Cashew. Yeah. Oh, cashew is yeah. a good one. What is love? <laughs> I just want to sing the song. Uh, <laughs> I don't know yet. I'm still <laughs> figuring it out. It's a journey. Yeah. What happens when we die? <laughs> I'll find out when I get there slash we go back to where we came from. Yeah, that's probably it. But I don't know what that is either. That's good. Uh, would you want to live forever? No. Do you believe in past lives? Yes. <laughs> what would you reincarnate as? Ooh, what a good question. Oh, my God, a tree. A tree. Definitely yeah. a tree. Yeah. Like a real big one. Mm-hmm. Why do we hurt each other? <sighs> we forget who we are. Mm. Fill in the blank. Kanye West is... really had to think about that one loved oh that's so nice Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's a telling question i went through a few options and i was like no those aren't current (laughs) me anymore that was like 2015 me that one was 2017 me (laughs) i don't really want to talk to those people (laughs) (laughs) yes that's good all right well tell us about what you're up to and what's Mm -hmm. next for you and where people can find more to work with you Yes. Um, well, you can find me most easily on Instagram at I Angelie Finch. Um, by the time this comes out, I may have reactivated my Twitter. I needed a break. It mm. was a rough place to be, but that is uh, at Jamie Lee Finch. Um, no, I am. What um, was rough about the Twitter? Oh You've gotten too many Twitter beefs? No, too many people don't like what I'm doing, I guess. And when I say too many, I mean just like, six but like <laughs> that was a lot for me oh I just I was in a pretty it had happened enough times and I was in a pretty sensitive like tender psychological place that I was mm-hmm. like I can't make people stop mischaracterizing me in my work but I can make it matter less to me and so I think I need to unplug from the way this whole thing is working and telling me that you know what consensus is because it's just I had I mean, I have clients and past clients and people who admire my work who are telling me every day this matters to me and has made a positive impact. And then there's like literally six people on Twitter yeah. that I've blocked and keep creating new accounts to. That's surprising not be kind to me that that would because yeah. I feel like you're the type of person which also l- similar to Michael Gunger in this way with Twitter, mm-hmm. where like I feel like there's been and maybe I'm wrong, but like this kind of playful game of like liking maybe it's your eightness of like wanting mm. the thing. Is there that was. Twitter worked for me when I needed an enemy. Oh. I don't need an enemy anymore. Wow. So even the audience I built on Twitter, which really liked when my enemy was their enemy, Mm. now that I've stopped needing that, the whole currency of that website has started breaking down for me. Um, So, yeah. So I even have a complicated relationship towards whether or not I'll reactivate it. Yeah. But I probably will and just let it sit and not do much. Yeah, have a new relationship to it and you can yes. space. Yeah. Good for you. Thank I'm proud you. of you. That's thank so you. like evolved. And yes, grow. thank you. I'm work we're working <laughs> on it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so it'll be I'm moving stuff from a marketing standpoint in a you know, towards um as much as I don't like the idea of like an email list, I probably should I'm gonna do I'm gonna do one. Um 
so yeah, so eventually I'm in the midst of restructuring a lot right now, but um, if people follow me on Instagram, they'll probably know when I launch and announce those things. Mm -hmm. Um, My, our friend Caroline and Mm -hmm. I do a workshop and we're going to be doing more this spring and then again in the fall. And so then you can see all that on Instagram. Um, My website is jamieleefinch.com. And from there, you can buy any form of my book that you want, whether it's paperback, uh, ebook or audiobook. Um, and then I eventually also, um, there's a wait list on my website to work with me as a coach. Um, and then also hopefully in the next six months, I'll have an online course talking about those objectifying systems and how we kind of divest from them and come home mm. to the friend that is our yes, physical bodies. Do it. That yeah. would be so great. Yeah. So there's a lot that's like about to happen. Awesome. So, mm-hmm. It's exciting. Yeah. 2020, new decade. Feels good. Feels good. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much thank for you. being thank here. You I almost said thank you much, so much for having me. That <laughs> was a weird thing. Thanks to say. for being here. You know, like, on I my show in my living room. <laughs> thank you. I like the other day. I was we were at the gym. We're trying to be gym people now in 2020. <laughs> we're trying to be gym people. Like just not as a gym person. <laughs> come on over. It's fun. I love it. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm like more of like the yoga like mm-hmm. that. Where it's so I'm like gym. It's just like it's it's intimidating, but mm-hmm. we're trying it. Mm-hmm. And some girl came over and was like, "Are you using this?" Like can I take this? Well, there was like a wait for me. And I was like, yeah. And she picked it up and I went, thank you. And then she <laughs> walked away and I was like, why did I just say thank you? That's like when, uh, the flight desk person is like, have a yeah. safe flight. And you're like, you too. Yeah. <laughs> Next weird, time like, you go somewhere. Social moments yeah. We yeah. say things where yeah. we're like, why did I just say I that? Love it. Well, but thanks for being here, Emily. <laughs> thanks for being on you know, my couch on welcome. my show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>